So now we're going to start our statewide organizing panel, and I'm going to introduce each person on that panel, and we'll get right into questions. So the first member of the panel today is Nicole Kane, formerly the director of the National Alliance of HUD Tenants for 28 years, and is the current director for Massachusetts Alliance of HUD Tenants, a statewide longtime housing and rent control. We also have Mark Fearer. He's a longtime tenant advocate in Boulder, Colorado. He writes a bi-weekly column on tenant issues at boulderweekly.com. We also have Robert Earl Wilson. Robert Earl Wilson was the former Secretary of State of North Carolina. He's a member of the Omega Sapphire Fraternity and Vice Chair of the DNC Poverty Council. We also have Genesis Aquino, the Executive Director of Tenants and Neighbors, where she works collaboratively with low and moderate income tenants to preserve at-risk affordable housing, strengthen tenants' rights, and eliminate homelessness in New York State. And Roderick Wilson, the Executive Director of the Eugenia Burns Hope Center, where he co-founded the Lift the Band Coalition. Roderick is a me board member of the Governance Board of Chicago Housing Initiative. He previously was a senior organizer with Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. <laughs> Next up, Susie Shannon. You all know her, the Policy Director for Housing is a Human Right. <laughs> Lastly, Art Rodriguez, the board, he's on the board of California's Democratic Party Renters Council and served as the Central Valley Organizer for the Proposition Excellent. Well, quite a panel, and let's get right to questions. And we can go down the line, um, and everyone will have the opportunity to answer. Let's start with the cool team, um, and we'll go down the line. First question In what ways? Can your states increase affordable housing and homeless housing in your state? In what ways can, in what ways can your states increase affordable housing and homeless housing in your state? Okay, uh, well just to start with that, uh, to start with that, uh, the state legislature actually did pretty well on funding housing for low income people in this last session. They increased a state subsidy program called the Mass Rental Voucher Program substantially. Uh, they've been inching that up for some time. We won, our organization won a reduction in rents from 40 to 30 percent of income for 9,600 people uh, that went into effect last week. Uh, so that's a victory. They, uh, there's also a lot of capital subsidies and there's an economic development bill that will throw another few hundred million toward housing. Uh, so that we did pretty well. Uh, and there's a huge budget surplus in Massachusetts. So the problem is not so much the money problem, uh, plus you have the city, got 200 million in ARPA money, they're putting into new housing. The problem is regulations. There is a firewall at the State House in Massachusetts about regulating the market. And, uh, and that's what we're doing terribly. I could elaborate this for Uh Well, let's move on to the next week. We'll go back to that. Mark? You just tell us what ways your state can increase affordable housing and homeless housing. Um, not being in any government of, uh, position, I, I can't really address that particular side of things. But I just want to bring up the principle that I believe that we can't build our way out of uh, lack of housing, uh, and affordable housing, specifically. It, it seems certainly in my state, because, because Colorado uh, does not allow rent control, there's a ban on rent control, as there are in many states, the majority of states, in fact. Um, so as a result, whenever affordable housing is discussed, almost never does rent control come up as an issue. And even in those states where uh, it's allowed, it's still often 
absent from public discussion. We really need to force our way into the discussion with rent control. So in spite of the fact that rent control is illegal in Colorado, that's what's going to increase affordability for most tenants. Great. Uh, up next, Robert Earl Wilson. Can you tell us uh, your statement? Good afternoon. I'm Robert Wilson from North Carolina. And I would simply say to you that probably one of the, there are two things I think the state could do. Number one, they could use the vacant buildings that we have now, turn those buildings into livable situations. <laughs> and number two, I would say to you that what we can do is cap the cost in terms of increase that a renter can impose upon a renter. Meaning, if you decide at the end of the year that you want to raise your rent, then you should not be able to raise that rent more than 2% in a given year. in the country, we are unfortunately facing an extreme housing crisis, right? We have about 92,000 counted home, uh, people without homes, um, and about 50% of the rental population is uh, rent burden. So right now, our coalition is proposing a set of bills. One of them is called, so we last year, we passed a bill called Housing Our Neighbors with Dignity Act. And this bill allows for the purchase of abandoned hotels and commercial spaces to be converted into affordable, 100% affordable housing. 50% of those uh, units to go to people who are from house and 50% uh, for people who are low income. Um, so right now, this uh, legislative year, what we're pushing for is for the state to give us $1 billion so it can be, uh, so the whole state can, can take advantage of this. Um, unfortunately, we do have a governor that just passed a billionaire budget um, and cut funding from, from housing that is very needed. Um, she also uh, rolled back a lot of the criminal justice reform that we were able to pass in 2019. And it really gives a strong message. It says that people, I mean, what we're telling her is that people need housing, not jails, right? Uh, we are also facing a major that is trying to criminal, criminalize the, the house population. So we are fighting to make sure that we are closing the loopholes also in the current laws and to make sure that people are no longer criminalized, people who are in house and people who, are, who live in poverty. Uh, again, another bill that we are trying to pass is called TOBA, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. And it's similar to what you mentioned, it will give tenants the right to refuse, the right to purchase the building, right? when uh, a landlord uh, is to sell the building. But not just that, it also gives the tenant the right to organize, and um, it has a lot of protections that I can memorize. <laughs> it's a very good bill. Um, it's very ambitious, because we have learned also from other uh, similar bills across the state. And again, I learned a lot from some of the people that are, that are here today. Um, and also, we are now trying to make sure that people who don't live in rent control or rent stabilized or affordable housing are also protected, right? Because rent stabilization only covers those buildings that were built before 1974 and has six or more apartments. If you live in a two, three family home, you are market rate and you have no protection. And a lot of people do live in those type of buildings. If the building was constructed after 74 and have no tax abatement, you are market rate too. So there's a chunk of people who are not protected. Um, and just in New York City, we have almost like million people. That was not cover the whole state. So we are trying to pass a bill called Good Cause of Vision. And Good Cause of Vision is to make sure that people have the right, first, to challenge a rent increase. Uh, let's say your rent is $500. Not, not, not realistic in New York. Let's say $2,000, one bedroom apartment. Um, but now your landlord decided to raise the rent for, I don't know, another $1,000, $3,000. Uh, 
you have a right to um, challenge that in housing court if the landlord tries to evict you, right? And what we're trying to do is for the landlord not to be able to increase the rent more than, uh, I think, 3% of the C the CPU? Uh, CPI. Yeah, so which could be high at some moments, but it will be very likely less than uh, the current increases, right? Um, again, this is a lot of bills <laughs> that we are trying to push. Again, COPA, good cost of issue, more money for Honda, and uh, we also have one more. It's called the Housing Assets Voucher Program. So it's basically a statewide voucher program that would have uh, would allow people to be eligible regardless of immigration status and regardless of conviction uh, status, like their criminal history. Uh, which is one of the signs, uh, because unfortunately the federal session aid program is very limited and excludes people with certain immigration status. And, and, and I think this bill also addresses the, the race uh, inequity, right? Um, in the class inequity, because most of the people affected by the housing crisis are black and brown people, right? And black and brown people uh, tend to have an immigration status. Uh, most of the people imported, at least in New York, are black immigrants, for example, right? Because of the criminal uh, history, or conviction history, let's call it like that. Um, and whether you're not an immigrant or not, again, we, we all we know, right, uh, the relationship we the black people have with the criminal justice system. So it's one thing, you know, it's, the housing issues is, is intersectional, and that's what we are trying to cover, uh, making sure that people have access to, uh, to housing, uh, regardless of their background. Um, I'll, I'll <laughs> let my brother speak. Hello. So I'm uh, Wilson out of Chicago. Uh, not to be confused with the handsome gentleman to my wife, Bob Wilson, <laughs> from North Carolina. But uh, I think the thing that we need to do is uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of things we need to do. First thing, lift the ban on rent control. In Illinois, there's a ban on it, you know, rent control. That will cost the state zero dollars, zero dollars. So that when people are in their homes, that will help them stay in their homes. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out how do we make sure people don't become homeless. So lift the ban on rent control. We have right to counsel when someone, uh, we're, we're passing a right to counsel a bill now where if you've been evicted, especially in Australia, you have a right to an attorney. A lot of times we are intimidated when we're going in eviction court. You, we often have a preservation act that gives um, subsidized tenants the right to refuse them. But where's the, where's the resources to help them to organize and to prepare themselves to buy their, buy their buildings? Um, so there's, there's a few different things we can do. I think we also, uh, I do agree with the gentleman to my wife. We can't build our way out of, the, out of this, but we do need to build some things. We do need resources for adaptive use. We need policies around that. So we got to have the resources, we got to have the policies. But the most important thing is we, it has to be a priority. And that's the problem. Because in our cities, in our states, we are budgets are based on priority, policies are based on priority. So when you see hiring a thousand more cops, that's a priority. But if you don't see any money going toward affordable housing, toward making sure people stay in their home, making sure prevent homelessness, it's not a priority. We have to make it a priority for those that make the laws and cover and, and control the tax dollars that we contribute to. It has to be a priority. And that only comes, you know, as um, Fred Douglas said, power is not yield without a demand. But it has to be a fear with that. And they have to fear the loss of their, their, their seats, their positions, their, you know, their status. Whatever it is, because right now the money power that exists creates all policies and all the things that we're dealing with that we're fighting against. So how do we counter that? And without that, you know, we're going to be in a rat race. And some policies we do create, they find a way to corrupt it. No, they find a way to scale it back. So we have to figure out how do we organize people power to really go against that money power. And we can, but it, but. Because that's the only way they're going to make it a part. Because otherwise, we wouldn't be up here. There will be no need for us to even have this summit. There will be no need for us to have the jobs we have. Because they'll be doing it. 
So we have to figure how we make this a priority for our legislators, our decision makers in our cities, towns, and states. So where are people supposed to live in California? The rents keep going up, people can't afford them, and our housing policy does not recognize in California the fact that people need to be able to live in their communities. So for every major housing bill that has passed in California, we have not had a mandate for affordable housing. There's 161,000 people who are unhoused right now, and we'll probably be adding more to that when the eviction moratoriums are lifted. Um, we, still not can, we still cannot get our legislators to understand, and I mean some of them do, but we can't um, get them to add affordable housing into our housing bills. So when our biggest housing bill that passed two of them, SB9 and SB10, passed out of our legislature, um, it didn't include a mandate for affordable housing. So low-income folks are invisible when it comes to housing policy. Everything is geared towards building more market-based housing. In the city of Los Angeles, we have 70,000 vacant units. We also overbuilt 71,000 market grade housing units and underbuilt 34,000 in the last seven years. This is why we have so many vacancies, because we're building more and more apartments that people cannot afford. And seniors on a fixed income, students, children who are living in poverty, our policies don't recognize them. The notion that we're gonna build mar more market rate housing and somehow rents are going to go down, I can tell you I've been working with our unhoused community since 2005, no one has ever gotten into a market rate housing that I know of or that I come from the street. It just doesn't happen. So until we mandate homeless housing, until we mandate real affordable housing that a waitress with two kids can afford, that people who desperately need it can afford, we are going to keep this in the The fact that we have a ban on rent control so that our city council members, our mayors, people who get elected and are on the front line of seeing the human suffering in their own district, who <laughs> can't even find relief for their constituents is unconscionable. And the League of Cities needs to step up to the plate once and for all on rent control and also on mandating affordable housing. When we're building new housing, that new housing needs to be affordable. This city has seen you know, two, two decades of building market rate housing and we are the homeless capital of the United States. And if that isn't a cautionary tale, I don't know what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, since we both share California, um, you know, the California Democratic Renters Council is the first in the nation, you know, it's the first of its kind, and it was created to lift the voices of tenants, to lift your voices. And, and just like Susie uh, highlighted, it seems like every legislator, every senator is introducing a production bill, but very few of them are addressing adequately the need for affordable housing, accessible housing. Um, and, and the fact is, is that our communities simply cannot afford to have another cost to Hawkins ran through. Um, we see that now. Um, and the fact is, is that BIPOC communities are being displaced. Um, and, and, and in much larger rates than, than, than we see anywhere else. Uh, and that catalyst to making sure there's accountability uh, to our legislators, to our bills, um, to ensuring that there's affordable production being made um, is what the intent of the California Democratic Renters Council was made. But California is a vast state. California um, can bro be broken up into many, many sections. And, and sometimes uh, the housing issue might be focused in San Francisco or Los Angeles, but the reality is, is that it, it, it's, it's throughout the state. And uh, a 
addressing housing in rural communities as well as urban is equally important. Um, and, and focusing on the, the details that, you know, our communities can't wait. Uh, our families who are sleeping home, sleeping outside tonight are being displaced tonight. Uh, that sense of urgency needs to be there. And uh, although it's trickling in, and mind you, California has a few uh, really good programs like Project Room Key and Project Home Key, and which Los Angeles and, and, and <laughs> many, many other places in, in the state have, uh, have produced housing. Uh, and that's, that's more or less where, where we need to be today, yes. Thank you. So instead of going down the line, whoever wants to speak first, and, and, and you can chime in, and uh, we can see where things go from that. But the second question is really about some issues that we, hope, that we talked about, rent control and rent stabilization. So we've seen campaigns for rent control and rent stabilization throughout the country, and they've been gaining some momentum. What is the climate in your state, and how are people working to limit rent increases and address homelessness? Can I take that? Sure. One? Sure. Um, uh, the primary question was about the state budget, and how we did. But the crisis in Massachusetts is just as bad as it is everywhere else. Uh, there are, uh, the rents right now are higher than they've ever been. They've gone up 17% in the last few months. This is after the COVID recovery. Uh, and before the crisis, a third of this, uh, uh, more than half, of the very low income people in the state were being squeezed out already, mostly people of color and particularly undocumented people. Uh, and that was a crisis before COVID, it got much worse during COVID, it's still there. So even though the state responded on the financial front, the, the regulation front has been horrible. Massachusetts banned rent control through a refer any kind of regulation on the market through a referendum in 1994. It passed by half of 1%. Four cities that had rent control were wiped out. Rents doubled with no invest uh, uh, investment in the properties by the landlords. They just pocketed <coughs> the money and that fueled another wave of speculation. We've been living with that ever since. So there is a movement to lift the ban. Uh, Representative <coughs> Mike Connolly participated in a forum yesterday. has <coughs> filed a bill to do that. The climate has changed because of the crisis and because uh, uh, there's been a movement of local elected officials finally getting elected. For 30 years, if you talked about rent control at the state house, they thought you were talking about terrorists. They look at you like you're ISIS, right? And you could literally couldn't mention the words, you'd be completely disrupted. That has changed in the last three years. Now there's a, you can talk about it. You can talk about rent control or rent stabilization. Uh, the mayor of Boston got elected by a three to one margin last year. And talking openly about rent control, she didn't miss words, she didn't, you know, regulation, safety, but you know, she said rent control. She was the only candidate who did it. She was elected by a three to one margin. Three to one margin. politicians on Beacon Hill, the state capital, that were blocking any kind of regulation. So the, the attitudes of the public have shifted, it's in opinion polls. Local officials like Mike Connolly are stepping up. Uh, but the leadership of the House and the Senate is still entrenched. They're in the pocket of the real estate industry, especially in the House, and they block everything. So in the last session, everything that related to regulation, TOPA, a right to counsel, this eviction ceiling act, these are some no-brainer bills. They just died. The lift the ban bill that Mike Connolly proposed died. A home rule petition that we filed from Boston to regulate rents and expiring use housing died. So that's been the pattern for 30 years, but the wall you know is starting to crack a little bit, and we're gonna try again in the next two years. So there's a two-year legislative session. Connolly will refile this bill to lift the ban and allow any locality to do whatever they need to do. In Massachusetts, uh, the state constitution does not allow any kind of market regulation without state approval. So we have to get something through the state house. Failing that, we will try 
a referendum, an initiative petition and referendum, times for the same two-year session. So it comes to a head in 2024. And hopefully that will clear the climate, not just for lifting the ban on rent control, but for the other issues, right to counsel, eviction ceiling, TOPA, and everything else that will regulate the, you know, the horrible windfall profits and speculative profits that the industry has been marketing at our expense. Um, I don't want to turn this into a session of what you think you have a huge ban for you. Because unfortunately, this is this says something about the state of rent control in this country, that we all have horror stories that we can share. I, I believe we're up to 38 states or 34 states that ban rent control in some form in, in states. Um, in Colorado, I think sadly we were the center of uh, this infection. Uh, because it passed in 1981, landlords uh, lobby, uh, banned it after we in Boulder tried to get a city ballot just to get it on the ballot, and they launched a nuclear strike of banning it ever anywhere in the state. And it, there's been no serious discussion about rent control for almost 40 years, until just recently there's been attempts. We, we have a, a, a Democratic majority in the House and Senate of the Colorado legislature and a government, a governor who's Democratic, although he's a libertarian, multimillionaire, uh, Polis. Um, and Polis, unfortunately, decided to um, threaten to veto a, a rent control, rent stabilization measure for mobile home parks. And that showed his true colors, that he's going to uh, stop any kind of uh, rent control, and he's about to be reelected. Um, this November for four more years. So it's pretty hopeless in terms of trying to get an appeal at the state level. There is some talk of maybe doing also a, um, a ballot initiative at the state level, um, but that might be the only way to get that done. So to, to me, this strongly calls for a, a national strategy amongst those states that have these bans to figure out how we can successfully challenge these bans. Uh, I would simply say to you that what we need to understand as a people is the game has changed. In the last 10, 15 years, we have seen corporations get involved in buying buildings and renting them. Now they have started buying individual dwellings, single family dwellings. And what that does is that drives up the cost all around. And when they do that, they understand what they're doing. So we have got to make sure that we understand the process. And what I mean by that is there are four different steps in terms of being able to set regulations in terms of housing and anything else you do, because everything you do is governed by some type of law. But I would say to you that we need to understand that the city government can be overruled by the county government. The county government can be overruled by the state government. The state government can be overruled by the federal government. And all of them can be overruled by the Supreme Court. So we need to understand the process and how that process works. I would also say to you that each and every one of you here today, the work that you do is priceless. You are, without a shadow of a doubt, working on the mission that was given to you from birth. You are doing God's work. And in doing that, it's going to be many times that it seems like what you're doing is in vain. But I want you to understand that any time, any time you do work that changes people's lives for the better, you are made better.
Of course. So we're talking about rent control and rent stabilization, how those campaigns have gained momentum. We want to know what's happening in terms of rent control and rent stabilization specifically in your state. And uh, you can update us. I know you already kind of did highlight kind of some of those bills. Okay. So this is a little background. So in Illinois, we have a ban on rate control. It was uh, established in 1997. Um, Illinois overall is has a Democratic legislature. There was one little period around 97 when the Republicans took over and out of the what is the American Legislative Exchange Council, right wing think tank of policymakers, lawmakers, and businesses come together to figure out how they create laws that benefit businesses, they will even swoop in and put this on the books. But currently, we have a Democratic governor, a Democratic uh, city president, a Democratic uh, uh, speaker of the house, with super majorities in both chambers. And they're the ones who are keeping this on the books. So the whole Democrat public thing is, is what it is. Because, you know, I'm going to get back to that, but to answer your question, we first introduced rent control in 2016-2017. When I went to Springfield, uh, me and another um, co-worker, Michael Coco, we went down, and no one would talk to us about it. No one. No one. One legislator even said to me, you're trying to mess with my money. That's what she said to me. But, you know, a year after that, we were able to move a bill. We got one set up. We, we did state. Uh, like four different town halls throughout Illinois. Now, Illinois has Chicago, and outside of Chicago, it's mainly wool. Uh, it's small, it's red. It, you know, you got little pockets here and there. You may have some Democrats, but it's a rural town, you know, it's cornfields and stuff. Um, and so, the next year, we introduced another bill. And last year, we, and we can't get out of the subcommittee. Last year, we were able to get our bill out of the housing committee. And at first, they established a housing committee in Illinois, which they never had. And that was due to the work that we, that we had done. And last year, we were able to get out of the housing committee, but we couldn't get it off the floor. We have 118 representatives in Illinois, state reps. And so we got to have at least 60 to move a bill. And depending on what the bill entails, we made the supermajority for the 71. Um, we have about 73 Democrats. So it seemed like, you know, if the lines were drawn, drawn by, pop, by uh, party, we'd be good, but that's not what's happening. Now, in Chicago, we have ran referendums, but in Illinois, referendums in Illinois are advisory, they're not binding. So we, we, we ran them, you know, 2018, uh, 2017. Uh, and it showed that people want this to the point that the governor we have now, we ran in 2019, he ran saying that he supports rent control. He's a billionaire. He, his family is prisoners. They own the Hyatt uh, hotels. Um, and he was running against the billionaire governor. I now mean, now he's really the trick bag. <laughs> but anyway, he won, but he had to say he supported rent control. But when he got in, he's done nothing on it. We pushed and pushed and pushed, and we haven't been able to get him to do anything on that. So we have been gaining every year. We've been gaining more and more momentum, but we haven't been able to get, get over that threshold. Because this, all of this is a simple thing. People, you know, I, I, the quick story that I'm going to the point. I went down to Springfield about 15 to 16 years ago, and I saw all these people with these red shirts on that said, Save Man Daily. And it was like children, it was elders, it was adults, all of them walking around with these shirts that said, Save Man Daily. And I'm like, what is this? And what I found out was, the Daily is a small town in Illinois, and they have a prison there. And the prison's on the clothes because they have enough people in it. So they were trying to keep the prison open because that was the main economic engine for that particular area. And you have a lot of these towns like that. But the people that's going to quit the prison, they're going to come from Vandalia. They're going to come from Chicago, South Side, West Side. I'm from East St. Louis. It's an all black city, only one in the city, in the state of Illinois. They're going to come from East St. Louis. So it's in their self interest to keep the prison open. So if we can't be naive and not think that the real estate lot developers are not moving in their self-interest. That's all they do. It's on us to move in ours. At the end of the day, you know, we, our democracy works because we elect people to represent us. But it's our job, our job to tell them how to represent us. What we do is we push the election. But we don't, we don't engage them. 
It's not a passive process, an act You gotta let them know you want my vote, this is what you gotta do. You gotta go on the vote for them. And after you gotta hold them accountable to what they told you you were gonna do. But it's a, it's a, and it's a grind, it's a constant thing. But that's on us. That's on us. When our elected officials are voting against us and, and they feel that it's in their self interest to take that money and not listen to us, then we have to figure out what we need to do to make them go back. Motherfucker, fear us versus losing that money. So we have to organize, and we have to figure out ways, like in Illinois, we have to increase our capacity to organize throughout the state. It can't just be a Chicago thing. We have to, and, we, and then when you get outside of Chicago, it's, it's different. You know, you have corn fields, wool. You know, how do we engage people, you know, around this and get them, you know, to the point, agitated to the point that they, be, they become active and they push their legislators. But we gotta have the capacity for that, and we gotta have the resources for that. And so that's where we're at right now. We're gaining every year a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But we haven't got the um, power, enough power to really push us over the threshold to really make this a statewide campaign. And that's what we focus on now. So um, California banned rent control in 1996 with a bill called Costa Hawkins. And it grandfathered in some you know, rent it, for some cities that had rent control already. So in LA, you have to live in a building that was built in 1970 <coughs> and before in order to have rent control. Otherwise, you don't have rent control. Um, we have a super majority, over two thirds of our legislature are Democrats. They could at any point, and a couple of um, legislators have tried, repeal Costa Hawkins. And all I can do, all that can do is allow your city government and even the full government counties to pass rent control if they need it. Right, if their constituents need it um, in that municipality. But that hasn't happened, and the legislature refuses to act. It won't, it can't even get out of committee. It's not even a matter of whether or not the governor will sign it. Uh, so now let's talk about the governor. So the <coughs> Town Care Foundation has run two campaigns to repeal or reform Costa Hawkins. One was Prop 10, and the other was Prop 21. Our governor opposed both of them and allowed them to, the opposition to use his image in um, campaign commercials opposing Prop 21. Then our governor hired the campaign director or campaign, top campaign consultant um, who was opposing Prop 21 to be his de facto chief of staff senior advisor. So this is the state of California. Um, we're blocked at the legislature, we're blocked <coughs> at the governor's office, and really only through a referendum, only through a proposition, are we going to be able to repeal Costa Hawkins. And so we're gonna try again in yeah. 2024. Yeah. And we're gonna keep trying again, because eventually people are gonna get it, <laughs> that we need to have right control. Um, on, outside of all of that, um, the real estate industry, their money is like a bottomless pit. So we were outspent of Prop 21, three to one. And we could have beat them, even being outspent, if it weren't for the outright blatant lies that the real estate industry basically said about Prop 21. That it was bad for renters, that it was going to hurt mom and pop, um, landlords and on and on and on and renters were so confused like we would hear from people all the time saying wait a minute is this actually gonna hurt us um, and this is the power of having a lot of money which we're even seeing of course in our in our mayoral race here too that when you have money you can put any message out that you want um, seemingly and you can control them what people think, and the way that they do that really is by lying and causing confusion. Um, so we need to address that. But I really wish that we had uh, a democratic legislature that actually would do the right thing and repeal Costa Hawkins so that we didn't have to go through all of this. I'll, I'll be short. But before 2016, we didn't have 
a legislator in all of California that would identify as a tenant champion. And so what the Redwoods Council did was to make that space where we have our legislators, our city councils, our supervisors, all lined up in, in areas that, that housing is super important and call, let them call themselves tenant champions. Um, and then when they don't vote the way that we can hold them accountable, we have them. And just, just like the legislature, uh, proposed legislation that comes through that isn't up to par, I mean, that's, that's the space that was carved out. Um, you know, being the first in the nation uh, gave us a you know, blank canvas to be innovative in how uh, we approach it. Uh, for instance, uh, today is the California Attorney General Rob Bonds has admitted the Renters Council board meeting, and uh, when he was an assembly member, uh, he, he was always present. Now that he's an attorney, attorney general, he created a task force on housing. So when we create uh, laws that aim to protect tenants, and we find that sometimes that enforcement arm is missing, and now we have a base to build on. And the fact is that the rent is too damn high. I mean, that's just it. So one thing that I wanted to ask was, when it comes to homelessness, now that more people are paying attention here in LA, for example, a lot of people will focus on uh, crime and they'll focus on cleanliness and they skip over rent control and rent stabilization. I think it's because a lot of people don't understand it and there's a negative connotation around it. So I'm wondering, how do you get people to read up and realize that there are some steps that can be taken instead of just focusing on the bright, shiny objects and saying, hey, I just want to get this out of my way. I just don't want to have to deal with this, clean it up. Um, and, and on that note, some of the people that you know, know about rent control or rent stabilization, they don't always vote. They don't always participate. So how do you raise awareness about these issues, uh, educate people, and, and help them realize that if they really want to end homelessness, they need to pay attention? I think, I think you know, it's, it's a crime. It's a, it's a door to door thing. Because we don't have money to put ads on TV. You know, we don't have that. And they, they, they have that. So it's a grand, a real grassroots effort. And it's a door to door thing, talking to people, you know, phone banking, knocking on doors, and, and helping people understand what it is. Because it does have a negative connotation. Because, I mean, one legislator told me that she, uh, she got calls into her district saying that rent control means the same thing as Section 8. And it was an affluent area in, in Illinois, so they don't want that. But but that's what the real estate lobby do. And we, and we should expect them to do that. We should expect them to lie. We should expect them to be deceitful. But, it, but in order to um, deal with that, we got to be face to face with people. We got to make sure we can help them understand and, and, and really educate and politicize people on it and then agitate them and get them mad about this. Because they got to be upset. They got to recognize the reason you're paying $3,000 for a two bedroom or $1,500 or you two months behind is because it will cost the state nothing to implement rent control. And that can help you stay in your home. And why, is, why isn't your legislator on, on board with this? But it's because the argument we have is a simple one. And it's one that whenever you're talking to people, they get it. But it's just having the capacity to reach enough people to really mobilize enough to really begin to change things. That's my thought. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think New York is a great example for rent civilization and rent control. And I think, I mean, I was thinking about your prior question. Um, but right now, although we have uh, those protections, right, we, we have lost 300,000 friends civilized units mm -hmm. since 1994. Uh, 300,000 300, that we know of. <laughs> um, and again, I think what we realized is that we needed to build tenant power. Uh, we needed to do organizing from the ground up. And we needed to also uh, build a coalition that includes the voices of people who not only live in rent stabilized or rent control apartment, but also people who are unhoused and people who uh, live in manufactured housing and different type of housing, even market rate, right? 
Um, and in some cases, build alliances with uh, small homeowners who are being used by the big corporate landlords, who oftentimes have the same interests as many tenants uh, when it comes to being working class, right? Um, so that, I think that made a big difference in, in New York uh, in passing the laws that we passed in 2019 and passing uh, the Honda Bill, for example, last year, right? Um, also, in New York, we really are pushing for, uh, uh, I guess in the city of New York, we have right to counsel uh, to provide legal services for people who are low income, although it does not go a lot of people because it's people who are poor. Um, right now, we are also now, we are trying to pass right to counsel 2.0. Right to counsel 2.0 is we asking the mayor of the city of New York to include funding, not just for having legal representation, because if you cannot afford the rent, you're still gonna get out, even if you have an attorney. But what we want is money to organize, uh, to do organizing, because we find, I find that when we have strong grassroots tenant unions, like that, I mean tenant associations, it's, people are less likely to get evicted because they know their rights and they know that they have power. Right, so at Tenants and Neighbors right now, uh, we have a campaign called Our Homes, Our Votes, and we are targeting people who don't vote in the primaries. If you know anything about New York City, New York State, really, uh, the decision is made during the primary, not during the general election. Unfortunately, most people do not vote in the, uh, in the primaries. And, you know, we are a democratic state, so if whoever wins the primary, that's it. That's the same person. So we are working with tenant associations, tenant leaders to build power and engage their communities and their buildings in the process. And again, targeting people who often don't vote in the primary to go out and vote, and also uh, adding an education arm to that, like, like you mentioned, right? Uh, letting them know who's taking real estate money or not, right? Also, there are different organizations uh, and grassroots uh, groups in the, in the state of New York, especially in the city of New York, who are also working to take money out of politics. Uh, taking money out of politics, I mean, uh, pushing the city, well, we won that. Uh, now the city of New York has a, com a campaign finance fund. So if you run for city council or if you run for mayor, you can um, get city funding to run your campaign, which <coughs> is good. Yeah, it's, it's a little problematic, it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but it allows people like myself <laughs> or people who work in my, who live in my neighborhood to run for office. Um, and that makes a difference because what we want is people who are tenants to be in positions of power, right? People who, who come from Because that's the only way we can, we can win campaigns. Um, and, and again, going back to your question, uh, to the other question about rent stabilization, in New York, like I said, we lost so much uh, apartments. And the reason for that, again, because of the lack of power, but also because we lost, we had a democratic, uh, how do you call it, the Senate and the Assembly, every vote for two. But we lost that in, I think, in 1994. So it's the last 20 years in New York, there, was a, there were laws that passed that created a bunch of loopholes in the rent stabilization law, which we tried to close in 2019, right? One of those, just to be quick, for example, if you, I live in a rent stabilized apartment, but somebody else is moving in, the landlord was allowed to charge 18% more than what I was being charged if, for one year lease. 20% more if you have a two year lease. Uh, that's in, on top of major capital improvement charges, or individual apartment improvement charges, which could go up to maybe 25 to 30%, right? So what we are doing now is trying to close those, well, we closed that in both. Uh, but now we are changing uh, uh, other smaller loopholes in the law, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, what redefining what it means to uh, to have a deterioration building uh, that is eligible for demolition and therefore destabilizing the property, which is legal now. Um, and a lot of landlords they stop doing repairs so that they can then qualify for this and take people out. So you see, although we have rent stabilized buildings, landlords get away with murder because they are able to do this. We are also trying to clarify the, the look back period for succession rights, right? Succession rights is a way of uh, ensuring, uh, how you call it, uh, 
not, not wealth, but security. Yeah, to make sure that people are able to, so that we can preserve affordability uh, with multiple generations, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, if I live in my mother's apartment, she's a leaseholder, uh, I may qualify for rent for succession rights. But the definition is so narrow that a lot of people do not qualify. So we're trying to close that loophole and also change the limits on rent increases when it comes to parenting. That, is, that means combining two apartments together. You can, you have two apartments, both of them cost $500. You combine them, you can charge whatever you want. You can set the initial uh, rent. What we're trying to do is change that so that landlords are not allowed to do that. And again, that's going to save a lot of people. Uh, that, that's going to save a lot of uh, affordable housing and uh, uh, ensure that people are able to stay in their homes. Um, in New York City, which is where most people live, most tenants uh, and most people, yeah, uh, we have a big problem, right? We don't have power over the law, the housing regulations. But the mayor can decide who is on the rent guideline board. The rent guideline board decides how much the rent is going to increase. And unfortunately, if your mayor is not pro tenant like the one we have now, uh, Eric Adams, you are uh, bad. You are messed up. Yeah. <laughs> we have about uh, 10 more minutes in the last Yeah, so we're trying to democratize the rent guideline board by allowing the city council, the public advocate, therefore having more people have access to those seats. People that look like most tenants in New York City. Also, I agree with you. What we need to do is we are, this country right now is in, in the throes of coming out of a pandemic. And what I think we need to do is we need to make sure you petition your congressperson to introduce into Congress, piece of legislation that says we will declare a four-year moratorium on increasing rent in the United States of America. No one for the next four years, tenant, should have to pay a higher rent than they are paying at the present time. There needs to be a four-year moratorium on raising rent, not just in California, but in every state in the union. Mm -hmm. And in following up on that, I also wanted to know, the second part of my question was about how you get more people to participate, you mentioned uh, getting pro tenant folks as representatives. Want to give us any examples of how you've been successful in doing that and how you get more people to vote? Anyone feel free to speak? So in districts that are majority renter, elected officials will shamelessly vote against renters mm -hmm. because they feel that renters don't vote or they're not registered to vote, and they're not empowered. Whereas the Homeowners Association has a group of people who are primarily registered to vote, are active in the community, and they invite elected officials to come and speak to them. Um, tenants are not necessarily organized like that. And these elected officials have not been held accountable. And a lot of renters don't even know that their elected official is voting against them and voting against their interests. This is something that we really need to work on, which is educating renters that um, they're being abandoned, they're being betrayed by their own elected officials um, when they represent the majority in that district. Another, uh, another point to add to what uh, Anastas and Susie are saying. Uh, it's very important to organize the tenants directly into tenant unions and develop leadership that can speak truth to power directly. Uh, not just uh, in, by voting, but by showing up at hearings, press conferences, being willing to talk to the media. Um, our organization is a tenant union. 
reorganize unions at the building level. That's what we've been doing since 1983. We've saved 12 and a half thousand apartments with individual rent control for those apartments, one building at a time. And all the other organizations up here, I think I know the New York Times Neighbors takes the same approach. Um, we also do voter nonpartisan civic engagement, register voters, turn them out to increase turnout uh, beyond what they had been before so the politicians notice and care. Uh, I want to come back to your question about the homeless, though. We, um, in Boston, there was a crisis when uh, previous Mayor Walsh, now Labor Secretary, abruptly shut down the Long Island shelter, which was on an island, 700 people in various recovery programs and a homeless shelter were thrown out on the street with two hours notice. They couldn't even pick up their identity papers. There was, people died uh, because they were just abruptly yanked out of their uh, recovery programs, right, and put in the street. Why? Because the bridge connecting the island had been condemned. So they just condemned it and threw everybody out without any plan or notice. We uh, joined a group called the Boston Homeless Solidarity Committee, where we reached out to the people who had been displaced, the homeless people, and formed, a, uh, we met weekly on Sunday, it was like church, uh, and we formed them into a fighting force. So they organized rallies, press conferences, marches. We took them to the city council as a group, trained them in how to lobby the city council, uh, demanding a hearing, et cetera. And in the course of six months, the mayor built an emergency new shelter within six months. Uh, they, uh, and eventually they reversed themselves and said they're going to rebuild the bridge to Long Island and build a recovery campus. Now that took four years to <coughs> commit to that. But the people who are closest to that pain <coughs> are the most powerful speakers. And we as organizers, can organize them into unions to intervene in the political process in a very powerful way and to get the media to pay more attention and tell their stories, to tell their stories effectively, to change the political game. Do we have time for one more? Two more? I'll be real quick. Um, and, and this is where uh, we can come up with, you know, strategy over strategy on building power, but unless we're talking to our abuelitos, our abuelitas, our tios, our tias, our neighbors, unless we're going to them and getting them registered, unless we're helping them get their ballots into the ballot box, nothing we're going to do is going to work. When we get our churches involved, when we get our neighborhoods involved, that's when true power comes, uh, and that's when we get to accept, uh, address the need that, that is tremendously vital in California, which is the need to get everybody housed. And I think what you're speaking to is the root cause of over apathy in our, in, our, in our communities. You know, when we register people to vote, only 20% of the registered voters are voting. 80% are not voting. You know, so we, I think we do need to register more people. Why aren't people voting? They're not voting because it doesn't connect to them. They don't think that their that vote is going to mean anything to them. When we ran out referendum campaigns in Chicago, we increased voters turnout because it was something that people resonated with. It, it was something that, that meant something to them. Now again, it's only uh, advisory, it wasn't binding, but nonetheless, it did increase it. So it's that it's that door to door, it's that person to person. And then we don't do tenant organizing, we do community organizing. So we work with communities, public housing residents, as a, as a larger group to get them to understand their own power and to go out and engage the community. I mean, we have a program, a mutual aid program, Rise for Senior, we got a bus. We take seniors to the grocery store. When we take them to the grocery store, what are we talking to them about? We're talking about rent control. We're talking to them about how the public housing authorities is getting rid of public housing land to a billionaire. We're, we're engaged them on issues that they wouldn't probably know about any other time, but we, get, we find an opportunity to talk with them while we're doing our mutual aid or doing whatever else we're doing. But it's that one-on-one, -on -one, it's that conversation, it's that making it resonate with them, it's connecting to their self-interest, I think it gets people out. But it is a grind. And I, I would say that in addition to the community organizing, we need to keep reaching out to those who do vote the most, namely homeowners, and making common cause with them. We need to convince them, and they already actually believe this, that 
stability in their neighborhood is dependent on renters staying where they are and not having to constantly move. Um, especially in college towns, this is an issue. So we need to find where the common ground is with uh, those homeowners and use that in, uh, during elections and general education campaigns. Thank you, let's hear it for our panel. If you would, uh, can you give me one moment? And the reason I'm asking for that moment is, at this point in time in your life, in the next 30 days, your life has a good possibility of changing for the worse. Right now, there's, there's a piece of legislation I want everybody that's got a cell phone Take out your cell phone and look this up. There's a piece of legislation called Moore, M-O-O-R-E, versus Hopper, which originated in the state of North Carolina. Now what that legislation does is it makes all state legislators independent of federal law, which means they can make in terms of drawing districts, in terms of electors, they can decide by themselves without any appeal to the state Supreme Court or the federal Supreme Court. There will be nobody that could question them. They could make it so that you would never, ever be able to win another election as a Democrat, ever. So I would like for you to look up that piece of legislation, Moore versus Hopper, H-A-R-P-E-R. -E and I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if that piece of legislation goes through, you are going back to segregation all over again. It is just that critical. If you think Roe versus Wade was bad legislation, repealing that, and Moore versus Hopper is, more, is Roe versus Wade on steroids, it is just that bad. So please, please pay attention to that legislation. Tell everybody that you know to somehow petition the Supreme Court not to pass or give credence to that piece of legislation. Thank you.